Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and welcome to Custody Matters Live with my, my wonderful host, Wendy Perry. Um, and we've both been sort of on vacations, been traveling and stuff like that. Um, totally refreshed now and re regenerated and, uh, and stuff like that. So Wendy, tell me what, have, what did you do? What have you been doing in the last couple of weeks since, I've, since I saw you? Well, I went to Indiana with my husband to visit my family and friends. I'm from Indiana and it was on my husband's bucket list to go to the Indy 500. So we had to go to the Indy 500 and it was such an exciting race. So, I mean, we really luckily picked a great race to go to <laughs> and the weather was amazing. Um, you know, it can be very, very hot and humid at the Indy 500, but it was absolutely beautiful and the race was super fun, super exciting, and we had a great time visiting family and friends, and it, it was a great trip. We did a road trip. We love to do road trips, and uh, we also stopped in Iowa to visit his brother, so um, it was really great. We had a really good time. That is and you, you were just actually kind of close to me you were in Austin for a while so tell us what you were doing in Austin well in Austin yes yeah. so I'm in I'm in a program with Landmark World Worldwide which is a self-development program and it's called the team management and leadership program and what I was doing is I was meeting with every, all the teams in North America from Canada to Mexico into the Caribbean uh, and we train every quarter around building teams and creating uh, creating leadership in the world. So a lot of it is is getting a lot of getting accountability and, and support around global projects that we're working on. And one of the global projects that I'm working on, I've actually had uh, I've been connected to somebody in Israel because in Israel, it's my understanding that the, this whole divorce uh, thing is kind of, it's not that it's new to the planet. It's just that it's not necessarily culturally, everybody, culturally people marry and they're just stuck with it, you know, till death do you part in some of the, the traditional uh, cultures. So unfortunately, when parents do divorce, there's no support system mm -hmm. available publicly to help the parents going through divorce and the children going through divorce. So I'm working with a group from Israel that's trying to bridge that uh, and create a support system uh, uh, project. So that's what I'm up to. Wow, that's awesome. I, I've never thought about that before, but it makes sense that in certain cultures where a divorce is uh, really, really seen as unacceptable um, that if you ended up getting a divorce you would be really ostracized by your entire community so i think that's really important to address and i saw the pictures of you online at your uh, team building conference and it looked like a great time too it looked like you had a lot of fun it really is because the thing is is it's it's a general team building kind of program and so everybody whatever calls to them whatever speaks to them their their calling in life that they want to do to expand themselves larger than themselves um, a lot of we put ourselves into this structure that that helps us to realize our dreams so I'm really loving it and I'm loving the opportunity to to see different parts of the United States as well that is awesome Awesome. So, who, who do we get to talk to today? Well, tonight we have a very, very special guest. Uh, tonight our guest on Custody Matters Live is Jaina Haney. And let me tell everyone a little bit about Jaina. She does a lot. Okay, so I'm just going to give a few things and then she's going to tell us some additional things about her work. Uh, but a little bit about Jaina, she uh, has a master's in science. She is an LPC, a licensed professional counselor. She is, she is EMDR trained, which I'm going to have her talk about that. Um, it is a specialized therapy involving eye movement, if I'm correct, and uh, it's a uh, has a very high success rate and it's getting a lot of buzz lately. More and more people are talking about it and I see that a lot in the support groups that I'm in. So I wanted to ask you to share a little bit with us about that in the conversation. Um, she is the founder of the Bridge Across for Single Parents and Step Families, 
Um, and then she also has private practice at the Wellness Collective and Red Dunn Ranch. And she is the clinical director of the ABPA, Attachment-Based Parental Alienation Pilot Program that is with Children for Tomorrow. And Jaina is uh, based out of Houston. And the way Jaina and I got acquainted was a few years ago, we had the Parental Alienation Symposium in Dallas. And Jaina contacted me and said, that she uh, wanted to be a sponsor with um, her company, The Bridge Across, for single parents and step families. And so um, she was one of our top sponsors at the Parental Alienation Symposium. So Jaina uh, is very um, involved and very active in helping uh, parents and step families with co parenting. So, Jaina, thank you so much for being on Custody Matters Live, and I also want to tell everybody that you're going to be one of the presenters at the upcoming Revealing Unseen Child Abuse Symposium in Houston in October that is also uh, sponsored and hosted by Children for Tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining us on Custody Matters Live. Well, thank you. Hi, I'm very <laughs> glad to be here. Nice to see you both. Hmm. So, Jaina, tell us you do a lot, <laughs> obviously, and, and I think you've got more to share with us than the things I mentioned. Um, when was it in, in your life that you realized that you wanted to do this work, helping families, and in particular, um, single parents and step families? Well, first off, you know, I, I, my husband and I have an empty nest, right? So I don't have any children at home. All our children are grown and gone. And I think that makes it a lot easier. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the other thing too is that um, when I divorced in 1998, I had these two young daughters. I never thought I would be divorced. Um, that was not something that was in the history of our family, my family growing up. And, um, then it was it, being a single parent was hard it was harder than i thought it would be and i actually had some pretty good support and then when i remarried in 01 i remember thinking uh oh you know even though i had done some work on myself that was much harder than i thought it was going to be and i actually really loved my you know my second husband and really loved our children i became a stepmom and but we had exes on both sides and it was crazy it was crazy and so we had a lot of help, but we still really struggled. Um, and we ended up in family court several times due to some different issues with our exes. And it was really, really crazy. And so what, what we ended up doing as a way to make lemonade out of lemons was we started um, working with, um, uh, I, I started trying to help with support groups. And my husband and I worked with single parents at our church. and. Then we also tried to do some, um, I worked with the Step Family Association of America, the Texas chapter, and discovered there was no Texas chapter, so I became the Texas chapter and learned, to learned my way around the family court system in the Harris County area and learned a lot about that just from, just as a way to um, figure out what was going on. And here I'm gonna turn the, the volume down on these crazy speakers that are talking to us. Let's see if I can do that. I don't know if I can or not. Let me think. Let's see. Uh, but anyway, it was just really, really hard. So, uh, you know, it, it was just something where we were just really struggling to try to figure out what to do. And we also spent a lot of time in therapist's office and spent a lot of time with um, other folks trying to figure out how to handle all of the different problems that we were having and my husband and I were uh, really struggling and so as a result uh, we kept trying to figure out what to do and getting getting training we went to the step family foundation in 2006 and that's when I started the bridge across as a way to try to help other couples who were in step family life figure out what to do and how to do it and so when we um, started doing that work more coaching and education and programs we were really excited to be able to do something that was helping our kids, but we still needed more and we weren't able to find it. And um, just over the years, we continued to see that where there were gaps in how therapists and coaches 
were not able to help us address things with our kids that we wanted them to learn um, how to do. And we would also seek help. And we were some things we were told were very helpful, but other things really weren't. And so when my youngest children turned 16, uh, I went back to school. So I was 48 when I went back to graduate school. And um, so I've only been practicing about four years, but I have this kind of 20 years post-divorce piece and my husband and I have now been remarried for 18 years and so we've learned a lot we have a lot of lessons and um, so I, I probably draw a lot on that in my practice and in my work with clients a lot around strategies and a lot around what we need to do and how we need to do it and most of my clients don't have the time or the energy to spend six months in therapy every week and I didn't either so I understand that. So I have, I, I'm, a, I'm a little confused and yep. I'm, I'm guessing if I am, the uh, viewers might be as well. So I want to make sure that we're understanding this. It sounds Fair like enough. you, it sounds like you and your second husband, you were on the road to divorce. I mean, you were, you were splitting up and you were, because you said you were going to family court and, and then through this whole process of trying to get help uh, for your family, you two ended up staying together and improving your relationship. It, it, am I understanding that correctly? Well, so I would say that we were, <clears throat> I, I would say that we were never um, on the brink of splitting up, but I would say that the first two years of our marriage were incredibly difficult. And I would say that we got married in, um, uh, let's see, early 2001. And um, a lot of things happened within the first year of our marriage. We um, uh, actually 9-11 happened about six months after we got married. But within the first six months of our marriage, we had issues on both sides. We had lots of lots of things going on with both exes. Mm -hmm. And then 9-11 um, happened, which kind of really discombobulated our entire world, right? Our entire sense of safety. And then in December, my husband was, um, had only been with Enron a couple of years, but of course Enron completely imploded and he lost his job along with 5,000 <laughs> of his fellow colleagues. And then in February, um, he um, decided that he was going to try to uh, stay, uh, start his own business so that he could be uh, with his children and not travel as much because he was a management consultant and he did not want to take a job that would have him traveling because he did not have a very flexible schedule with his ex. He would be unable to kind of make up time if he missed it. He loved to coach his kids in soccer and loved to do all those things and would miss his visitation time. And then about a month later, he ended up being uh, being served. And so mm -hmm. within the first year of our marriage, we just had a lot of really big things happen. And I don't think that's unusual in step family life. And, and I remember thinking, you know, we are going to have to either come together and figure some things out, or this is going to really mess us up really quickly. And so for us, we kind of batted, batted down the hatches and we really worked hard together to, um, kind of develop some daily habits of, uh, talking to each other, telling each other it was going to be okay, doing some praying, uh, watching funny shows. We would watch Seinfeld every day. We'd watch the 10 o'clock episode every night. That was the big thing on at the time. Uh, we would make a point of uh, uh, laughing, trying to laugh together. We would make a point of staying affectionate, keeping our passion alive, being connected to one another. We would make a point of just having these daily habits every day of really working through our problems. And the thing is, after doing that for several years and going through the lawsuits and everything, it kind of is something that we kept has really kept our marriage going. And so now we keep those same habits through. So through all the good and the difficult in our relationship, we have these really wonderful and amazing habits that have kind of been modeled for our children, you know, how you live your daily life together. So it's been a good thing. That's like awesome. It. So, so, so when you said you were going to family court, yep, you you meant you were going to family court because of the uh, so exes, of, yeah. the so other parents. Exes okay, was, I understand yeah. now. Yeah, mm -hmm. we and just I don't like to go into too much detail because, right, you know, our children yeah. love their other parents, and of and course, so uh, yeah. So we something don't I want to bring up, about that. and it was I'm my sorry? experience. So something I wanted to bring up that was my experience, and oh my gosh, I get the family court post-divorce <laughs> that you're helping your spouse go through. 
Uh, but the people, it was my experience that I was completely ill prepared to go into a blended step family. Um, yeah. and, and of course, coming from a religious background, I mean, even in the, in the churches and in uh, organizations, they, I had, I didn't find any support. I did not find anybody who knew uh, the, the, um, how to deal with a step family. They wanted to treat the step family as the uh, intact family. Like this is how you do marriage. Like marriage is the, is no matter what it, uh, when it happens, who is in there, the, the marriage is treated the same. And we know it's not. <laughs> There's right. so many yeah, and I the step family. Yeah. And I think that there's a couple of things there. So one is the step family is just so different. And I think there's a lot of things that happen in step family that we just don't have any control over. And you know, you can you can be the most wonderful stepmother, the most wonderful stepfather in the world, but if the if the biological parent that's not in the picture, right, or the, the you know, like if if I'm a stepmom, uh, but the biological mother, you know, doesn't like me or has problems or bad mouths me to the children, right? Mm -hmm. Then when the children are at my house, you know, they're going to have some loyalty conflicts with me as a general rule. Now, not always. Sometimes you'll get kids that will, will be able to overcome those loyalty conflicts. And those are kids that maybe have a stronger resilience piece maybe they have a stronger personality a stronger temperament but a lot of kids don't and so you can be a really great step parent even a really great biological parent but sometimes that other biological parent will really create problems and so a lot of times it's about making peace with what you have control over and what you don't and then the other piece of that is the you know, I think family court is very traumatic. I think being sued and being pursued is hard. And I don't have to tell, I don't have to tell Wendy about that. You know, it's, it's hard. Being targeted is very hard. It creates a lot of uh, hypervigilance on, on people's part, it, 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 which would make sense. It creates PTSD symptoms, even though uh, people, uh, you know, it, it doesn't meet the definition because PTSD is the official definition is around big T trauma, which is crime, natural disaster, um, but, uh, or, or um, uh, you know, these uh, abuse, but certainly it, it is very, very difficult and it, and it's, it, 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 it is PTSD. And, and I see it all the time that people come away from that, which is this crazy feeling, the feeling of being disorganized and, 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 and needing the same kind of help that anybody with PTSD would need. So I do think that it creates a lot of problems. You know, that something that I noticed is that a lot of times, like when you're going through psychological evaluations, extensive uh, things, sometimes a, a mental health counselor is not, has not been educated in the distinctions of recognizing post-traumatic stress in in the realm of child custody because the thing is is P, a parent could be very much in survival mode and losing the the you know a relationship with their child is very traumatized or the thought of the fear of losing a relationship with your child can throw you into a very traumatic experience of post-traumatic stress and there's a lot of mental health counselors that are not have not been trained to recognize that Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and the reality is in graduate schools, even now, for psychologists, for psychiatrists who, are in, who go to medical school, for LPCs, for LMFTs, the reality is the training is all still around the nuclear family. There is only a small portion of the training that's for step families or single parent families. There's very little training around divorce and custody. And as a result, any training that any therapist gets on any of these topics around court, family court, any of that stuff is going to be very broad and very general. And unless you've been through it and understand it, you're still not going to know what to do with it. And then I also think that people just oftentimes have a very limited understanding of how difficult it is. And I know for myself that certainly I don't think I would have had any sort of understanding of how difficult 
it was unless I myself had been through it. And then I think one of the reasons why I can deal with it the way I do is because I'm 20 years past it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if I were a therapist that was going, you know, that was going through it while I was a therapist, I can just see how it would trip my own trigger, right? Or mm -hmm. how it would kind of color or shade how mm -hmm. I worked with the family or how I, uh, how I worked with couples because I can see because I think oftentimes two therapists have a really hard time staying neutral and they do tend to choose and that's a big that's a big problem I think too in the mental health community where they're, they're still very biased in some ways wow you are just you are saying things that I that were like they're so resonate with me it so resonates with me just from my own past experience of, of mental health counselors choosing sides. Mm -hmm. uh, I just recently had a situation with a guardian ad litem that was that I was I was speaking in a court hearing and and I see very clearly the guardian ad litem was was definitely choosing sides and that's not their role and uh, and the fact that they've not been trained. Wow, totally. Thank you, Jaina. <laughs> Validation. Yeah, I'm gonna get myself right. into trouble. That, that is a problem. I'm a little, I'm a little bit of a straight talker, but you know, in the four walls in the therapy room, I do think it helps a lot, right? I, I Just think it's really it the way it is. It's really important, and you know, Jano, we all know um, what you were saying about um, that. There's virtually no training or education. Um, when you go into this job that is about divorce families or step families or single parents um, or about co-parenting and so but to other people um, that's shocking news um, because it's it just seems impossible how could there not be this education and training for these professionals but this is what we hear from parents all the time is they just can't understand how can it be that they go to these mental health professionals and and these mental health professionals don't understand or are not trained to deal with these situations and i was going to share something with you you know i'm friends with several mental health professionals uh counselors and and they're great and they want to help families they want to do the right thing but they're frustrated that they were not trained and, and given this education and the other thing is something that they have shared with me is that sometimes you will have a family come in and let's say they get 30 minutes with each parent. And if one of the parents is a very, I don't, I don't like to say narcissistic too much because I can't diagnose, but you know, let's say that they're very charming, convincing, cool, collected, persuasive, <laughs> all, all those qualities, right? And so some of my mental health professional friends have shared with me that, you know, if, if, if they have that parent um, in the room for 30 minutes and they're very cool, collected, charming, convincing, all of those things, that that's just not enough time for them to assess and to figure out if they're legit or not. And, you know, in this process of presenting themselves so well, then of course they say the other parent is a complete disaster and of course the other parent really might be a disaster because they are possibly losing their children and and that would make anybody frantic so it's a really it's a really difficult situation for those families and very frustrating and hard for them to understand that the training and education is not there and i think it's so important that there are people like you who are proactive and getting involved in uh, educating and helping step families and, and families of divorce. Well, I do, I do a lot of work with, with parents and with step parents and single parents and, uh, you know, around kind of strategies for understanding that, um, that the way that you present yourself to a mental health professional, to a custody evaluator, to an amicus, you know, does become really important. And it's not about you knowing everything there is about parental alienation. It's, it's not about you being a fountain of knowledge. You know, um, it's about uh, flexible thinking, managed emotions, moderate behaviors, right? It's about mm -hmm. being this, you know, 
person that doesn't try to have all the answers, doesn't try to not take responsibility for things, but also can, you know, string two sentences together, <laughs> mm-hmm. can listen. And so a lot of what I'll say to people is, you know, you know, at the very first session, you know, if you're meeting with somebody uh, regarding your child, whether it's a therapist, whether it's an attorney, whether it's an amicus, you know, the goal is always to, to say, I'm interested in what you have to say. I'm interested in learning anything I need to know, how I can help my child. And um, to, to be someone that is willing to make changes and to learn how to be a better parent. And, and while it's true that when you're in a room with someone for 30 minutes and they can be very charming and very manipulative, most, most, you know, most people will have a hard time saying that and then coming back in the next time and actually being able to say, yes, I, took what you said and I was able to work with my son and make some changes. And so it's, it's the steadiness and it's the, it's the words and the behavior matching up. And so someone like a narcissist, and I try not to use labels either because Mm -hmm. it doesn't really help. will will be able to talk and talk and talk, but not walk the talk. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to be able to walk the talk, but it's also just to be able to, listen and ask questions and be interested in what that person is saying to you. And that will take you a long way with anybody that you're talking to. Because often what happens is when we're pursued or sued, we, we, are, we get so much on the defensive <laughs> mm. that we're trying to prove and record and convince. And then it ends up just, it just ends up killing us. Well, and I've also seen with a lot of parents when they are in that mode that you're talking about, where I have to record everything and I have to document everything and I'm thinking about court every single minute. Um, They're focusing all of their um, time and energy and thoughts on court, so to speak, and legal actions um, and not focusing as much on the relationship with their child as they should. Um, And so that's something that I know I talk to parents about a lot and probably Danica does too, is that when your kids are with you, make sure that you're present and um, having, fostering that good relationship with your kids. Don't be obsessing over court and recording conversations and documents Mm -hmm. every single second. You have to put that time and attention into the relationship with your kids when your kids are with you. It's very important. Right. Yeah. Ab- yeah, absolutely. And I know you, you work really hard to do this and I know that Danica does too. And so there's kind of two pieces to this, you know, one is um, our amygdala, <clears throat> which is that part of us, that fight, flight or freeze, the part of us that has all of these emotional emotions and emotional memories. It's always operating in the past or in the future. And when we get upset, it always comes from our amygdala, which is our, the feeling part of our brain. And the best way to use our thinking brain and to keep our emotions down and in control is to really use our thinking brain. And the way we use our thinking brain is to stay in the present. And whenever you're going in the future or whatever you're in the past or whenever you get upset, it's because you're always in the past or the future. So stay in the present and use that thinking brain. And the more you do that, the more that you'll be able to stay calm and to be doing what you need to be doing. Another way I kind of explain it to clients is um, it's kind of like, you know, we have all these different things in our lives that are important. We have our children, we have our work, we may have a partner, we have friends and we have things that we love to do, right? And these are all parts of a good and healthy life. And what happens so often is that when we have a problem like an ex that's very difficult or this heartbreak of family court, then as if you're a good, decent person, you start trying to solve that problem. And so you will constantly be going back to that problem because our brain keeps trying (laughs) to solve that problem. And the more we keep trying to solve the problem, we, we start kind of creating this 18 lane highway in our brain to that problem, right? And we, and we end up 
if we only have a 24 lanes of highway in our brain and, you know, 20 lanes of it are devoted to that problem, right? Mm -hmm. Then we don't have much time, energy, or highways left for anything else. And we exhaust ourselves. We don't get sleep. We, and, and the truth is, is that we're still not solving the problem. And what I say to people is, you know, the goal is you want to make Things like that. You want to understand why your brain does that because it's trying to solve a problem. You want to understand it's not helping you. It's not helping you. It's not going to get you anywhere. And you've got to tell your brain that it's not helping you. And so then you've got, and I tell little children, you're the boss of your brain. Mm. So you got to tell your brain, can't do that anymore. Got to stay in the present. And you want to make that 18 lane highway a go path. So we want you, we don't want you to travel there very much. We want you to travel there where you need to, but most of the time we want you to develop those highways to all the things you love in your life. And we want you to keep those things that you cannot control the goat path. You know, and that's where the serenity prayer, right? Comes into mm -hmm. play. God grant me the serenity to, uh, you know, change the things I can, the, you know, what is it? The courage to change the things I can, the, um, uh, to, to know what things I can't change and the wisdom to know the difference. I don't, I can't remember the exact order, but the point is you, know, you want to make it a go path. And so if you're somebody that is doing that 18 lane highway thing, you've got to stop and you've got to just tell yourself it's not helping me. And when you, and just be aware that you're doing that. And I know it sounds simple. I'm not trying to make it sound simple, but to some extent, a lot of it's just awareness and just understanding that that's just what our brains are doing. Wow, Jaina, this is like amazing stuff. Yes. I mean, this is awesome. And it, this is good for anybody to listen to and to learn about, not just divorced parents or single parents or step families. This is, this is good life skills for anybody. Yeah, I, you know, I, I call it the staying out of that what if world. That what if yeah. world of the fear of what if is, is not allowing you to live in the now. Um, so, and unfortunately in the now we run out of time. Ah, can we just have Jaina tell us real quick, um, about, about what you're going to be talking about at the Revealing Unseen Child Abuse Symposium in Houston in October, because, um, it's a really great opportunity for people to come and hear you speak in person and to meet you and I think after hearing you talk tonight a lot of people are going to go hey I want to go and 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 see her speak so just tell us a little bit about what you're going to be presenting about at the symposium in Houston in October if you would well sure well we we um, are going to have a lot of really great speakers going to be talking about a lot of great topics and I'm just going to be talking about what we're doing with the with the with the pilot program, which at that point won't really be a pilot program anymore, but we're expanding it. We are creating some additional assessments to complement it, um, and we're going to be doing some additional trainings. We've had a lot of mental health professionals who want to be trained in it. We're going to be doing it. We're doing it in some different counties, and we it, it's very very exciting the things we're doing. And um, and I'm just going to be uh, really supporting all the other cast of characters that are going to be there and also just answering questions about uh, the different ways in which we're really trying to help and support uh, parents and children and families in our communities. So it's, it's very, very exciting. And I have loved talking with you all today. It's just mm -hmm. been my pleasure to be here. Oh, well, everybody watching, if you want to hear Jaina speak in person, if you want to meet her, again, she'll be presenting at the Revealing Unseen Child Abuse Symposium in Houston, Texas on October 18th, 2019. Um, and by the way, if you are a professional, if you are an attorney, counselor, a therapist, or if you are a teacher or a school administrator um, and you're licensed in Texas, you will get eight continuing education units for attending this symposium and it's very affordable as well so I just want to mention that this is a great opportunity to meet Jaina in person so thanks again Jaina so much for being with us it was great information for, for everybody I, I can't wait for everybody to hear your great advice that you gave tonight awesome thank you guys nice to see you
All right. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions and if you want to contact Wendy or myself, you can always uh, private message us from our Facebook uh, pages that, that, that you are seeing this on. So uh, we're there to be of service and we will see you again next week.